Hello. All right, so we are we are live on the on the YouTube's. <laughs> on the interwebs. On the interwebs, yeah. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, this is our first one virtual lecture for the year. Um, I hope to have two more. Um, right now, there's a tentative date for uh, NASA on October 30th, and then another one, I can't think of the date now, it's in November, and it is about citizen science and uh, how to participate in scientific research even though you're not a scientist or never went to school to be one, and how to do that kind of stuff. And that's, uh, that's Chandra Clark, she's a journalist and has done things on citizen science before. But today, I'm very happy to have Dr. Amy Green with us. Uh, Amy has received her PhD in literature from UNLV in 2009. She specialized in Shakespeare and 19th century American literature. Uh, today her work has evolved and she focused on popular culture studies, especially with regards to literature, film, and gaming. Uh, she believes that more traditional analysis and interrogations, which are the hallmark of the liberal arts, excuse me, more generally, should also encompass our popular culture. She's especially interested in the expanding presence of video games as a compelling source of narrative, one that is necessarily particip participatory by nature. Most of all, she loves her time in the classroom sharing readings and thoughts with students from all backgrounds. I'm happy to have Dr. Amy Green here. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here with you guys. So, yeah, 19th century literature, now here I am talking with you guys about video games. And what's even scarier is that specifically with the 19th century literature, I specialized in Henry James, of all people. So we are, I guess, I see. Uh, so that being said, I'm curious to those of you that are here today, how many of you would identify yourselves as gamers, just in terms of how the conversation? So there's three of you there, and then, uh, of course, and of course, Adam, and then three of you, uh, maybe not so much here. So what I kind of want to do is to split uh, my time here with you into two into two pieces. So what I wanted to do first is to pr present some research that I've been doing about the academy and video games. And then what I want to do after that is to get a sense not only in terms of sharing my own experiences with this label of gamer, but also for those of you that play video games and might consider yourselves a part of the larger gaming culture, what your perceptions are, um, I think especially because the media coverage about gaming tends to be uh, almost universally negative, and I think in some ways very one-noted, in ways that I think, first of all, are not accurate or fair, and second of all, which divert attention to some of the more important realities about gaming uh, in terms of the entrenchment that it really has with most of us in our culture. So that being said, the, the reason why I started to really consider video games and to really look at them as an avenue for, for study and for consideration is that they are so, they, they're so much a part of many of our lives. Not just those of us who would say, okay, I'm a gamer, I play online, or I game and I, I play competitively, but many of us not only game competitively or with more frequency, but also casually. And not only that, but as technology has expanded, certainly from the first of the consoles to where we are now, which is incredible, if you haven't seen what some of the games are able to do with graphics and with storyline, we really are getting to the point where the stories that a lot of the good video game titles are telling are worth notice. They're worth a place in a classroom. The same way that we would look at literature and film in a classroom and nobody would bat an eyelash putting those things together in a course, I think that we're really coming to the point where we need to consider video game narratives as a component of studying text and theme and symbolism, all of the things that we would do anyway if we're studying in, within the liberal arts. So to that end, it's something that I do in my classroom and I'm actually working right now to develop a course here in Nevada for spring that would be a literature course that requires gameplay of Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite and along, uh, which are two of my favorites I have to say, and then along with that we will pair the literature thematically to sort of follow us along with our gameplay. 
Uh, there are some universities around the country that do have inroads into gaming, and I know Morningside um, is one of them, but it's still very, very rare, and I think sort of looked at maybe kind of with a skeptical or a sideways eye. So that being said, the, f the first thing that I think is so important is this divide that's growing now that video games are starting to get a little bit of interest from the, the, ac the academy is the conflict between the ludological standpoint and the narratological standpoint. So for those of you that aren't sure what those terms mean, uh, ludology basically is the study of video games from a gameplay standpoint. So think of it in terms of structure. What is the game requiring me to do? What are the controls that I need to do in order to meet the goals that the game has set up for me? The narratological side is more in line with looking at the game as text and considering symbolism, theme, character development, and looking at those larger issues. And if you look at the Academy's literature on this, it's going to be presented as though these two sides are irreconcilable with each other, and I think that's a real shame. Uh, although I am going to favor the narratological aspect, and that's what I'll be talking about here in a moment, there is a place to consider gameplay and what that means. And I think, again, it's, it's unfortunate when you see the Academy divide itself artificially in, in ways where there didn't have to be a division in the first place. So I'm kind of hoping that I can bridge the ludology side a little bit, even though, like I said, I do ultimately favor the, the narratological point of view. So I wanted to start with Clint Hawking's term, ludonarrative dissonance, and that's quite a mouthful. It's a term that applies to places where the gameplay doesn't match with the story that the game is telling. And I think this is kind of a good way to start to consider how both of these discussions, the ludology and the narratology, both have a lot of merit and a lot of, and a lot of importance. So for those of you who don't game, some, I, I'll try to explain these examples as well as I can. For those of you that do, I'm sure that some of these will sound very familiar. But I've had some recent gaming experiences that are both good and bad in terms of this idea of the dissonance. Uh, there was the recent release of, well, it, it was called PT, and that's a really vague name, for what was actually a playable dem a demonstration of a new Silent Hill game. That's very confusing. The studio was testing out their new, uh, their new gaming engine, and they kind of wanted to hide that it was a Silent Hill game. So basically what you had if you downloaded this trailer uh, was absolutely no direction whatsoever about what you were supposed to do. You were in part of a house with basically a hallway that sort of would connect you around. You could go down into a basement. If you went through the basement, you would come back to the same place that you started. So at first it would seem like you were just in some sort of bizarre loop with no sense of context and no real sense of direction. If you continued and stuck with it, and you continued to essentially, without direction, go through this house and make this, this loop a number of times, things would eventually begin to change and you could kind of see that there were things you were supposed to do or things that you were supposed to interact with. Right up until the end, I would say that it was kind of a brilliant way to introduce a game. Throw the gamer in and give them relatively easy controls but not tell them what they were supposed to do, not provide a real sense of goal uh, or a sense of objective. But what I will tell you is I ended up getting extraordinarily frustrated with the end of it because I felt that dissonance. Uh, the very last part of this playable trailer allows you to unlock the real Silent Hill trailer where you could watch the movie demo for the new game which is kind of the whole point for people that were playing it. In order to do that you have to get a series of random, you have to get a, a couple of events to happen which in any way that I've tried to play it appear to be completely randomized. There is a, the ghost of a baby, and I know that sounds really weird, just bear with me, that you have to get to laugh uh, three different times. Uh, the context and the circumstances under which you can get that to happen um, do not seem to follow any true rhyme or reason. The first one may be okay. That one was a little bit more straightforward. They kind of gave that one to you a little bit by virtue of moving through the space. The rest of them, not so much. And so it became less about the story, which had been fairly interesting, and more about how do I get this game to move me to the next part. So for me, that created the dissonance. Uh, another recent example for a major title for that came out is a game called Thief. I don't know if any of you guys yeah, see the nodding. Um, I was disappointed in the game. I felt that its really clunky map system 
would constantly pull me out of the environment of the game itself and would instead present me with being frustrated trying to move through the environment instead of enjoying being in the environment in and of itself. So I think that this idea of dissonance is important because again if we're talking about story if you can't get through the story or you're constantly drawn out of it it would be like reading a book with really bad prose you're going to get drawn out of the story no matter how good it might be at its core there's just not enough that's going to hold your interest before you sort of give up and walk away or become frustrated with it now on the other hand there can be ways in which the ludological aspects can be much more seamless where the gameplay feels like it makes sense and what you're asked to do as a player makes logical sense in the larger context of uh, in the larger context of the game, so I would use, for example, Dishonored, which had a really good system where you could sneak. You had the choice between using violence or sneaking through the environment and avoiding most, if not all, direct conflict. And in the way that those mechanics worked, as opposed to Thief, which was very clumsy in its control it really felt like you were making choices that were significant to the narrative and that could adapt to the way that you as a player would want to play the game so it's not always that those things can disconnect but when they do it can really pull you out uh, of a storyline now in terms of the last part I want to talk about with ludology is that there are ways that someone a player and I'm sure those of you who play have done this you can manipulate uh, the ludological aspects of the game to your own advantage and I think that this impacts gameplay, not so much the story that the game is telling, but again, it, it forces the player to interact in interesting ways. So let me give you uh, one example. The recent game, Watch Dogs. I don't know if any of you guys have played that one. Uh, it's kind of set up in some ways like Assassin's Creed, which might be more familiar to some of you out there. Uh, there's an element where there are certain territory, there are certain areas that are set up where you have to go and do missions for the game. And they will be marked off in red. So you know that you're going to enter a quote-unquote danger zone where p enemies will be looking for you. But they don't look for you <laughs> if you're not inside that red area. And this was especially true with Watch Dogs. So what that meant is I could go right up to a red zone. So I could literally see the enemies inside and I was looking at them. So my character's looking at them. Uh, they wouldn't do anything to me as long as I hadn't triggered them. So what that would give me was an opportunity to try to clear out a horde of enemies. I could try to throw in a couple of bombs, and they were not going to react to that because I hadn't triggered uh, the, the gameplay zone. So there's ways in which the ludology can allow us to disconnect and ways that allow us to sort of manipulate how the gameplay works by figuring out what the game will and won't do, what the artificial intelligence in a game can't or can't figure out how to do. So the ludology, like I said, is important. But I do think that for me as a gamer, it really is about the story. And I think, again, that's my background uh, coming from, from English and from literature, uh, that that is really what has drawn me into video games for many, uh, for many years now. So that being said, I would like to see the Academy focus on really treating a lot of these stories seriously. I do think that part of the problem is that the media coverage, which we'll get to in the next part, really makes that difficult. Again, because it tends to be very one-noted uh, and very unwilling in many ways to concede anything that games do that would be significant or important. Now, one of the first things that comes up as we begin to consider as we begin to consider narratology and what it is that games are doing. Uh, first of all, of course, games are immersive. That is the hallmark of the gaming experience. You sit for any number of hours. And for those of you that don't play, some of the games that you might find on the market today, they're short ones that may only take five, six hours to play and you'd be done. There are games that take 30, 40 hours to play just to get through, say, the main chunk of the story, and then you could potentially invest a lot more time doing side quests or extra missions that the game would give you to do. Now, I don't know about you, but there's not a lot of novels that would necessarily take me 40 hours to be able to read. So when I look at this as a whole, what I'm seeing is an awful lot of time spent in a, in a virtual world with a virtual set of characters and what in some cases are these very interesting and compelling storylines. And I think that when we are investing that much time in anything, in a virtual world, it becomes very important to consider what's going on in that world. Not just what are the mechanics from point A to point B, but what is actually being said or put out there or put forth uh, that might have larger significance 
as a text and even perhaps cultural significance depending on depending on the video game. So as I think about this, there's there are a number of folks that are starting to talk about video games. I don't agree with all of them, but one of them is um, the scholar Ian Bogost. And he had this really interesting comment where he said that game engines regulate individual video games artistic, cultural, and narrative expression. So he's basically saying that video games become limited uh, by the mechanics that, that are containing the rules of gameplay. And I think that's, that's a little bit limiting. And what I like instead is to go back to some of the things that we would consider when looking at a novel or a story from a narratological perspective. These are what Roland Barthes calls the cardinal functions. And these would be, say, the interlocking plot events. So what are the main issues of the plot, of the, the main plot of the story? And that goes along with what he calls the catalyzers, which are complementary events. So picture a main narrative plot and then any number of subplots that would branch from that main plot. And when I consider, for example, a series of games like Bioshock, I don't understand how we would put the definition on it that Bogost would have us do, that it is limited by the fact that it's essentially limited by the fact that it's in that form and not in another form. Uh, for example, in Bioshock, the entire world is intended essentially to function as catalyzers. The, the player can go through and find um, secondary material, audio recordings that tell the stories of various other characters in the game, some of them important, some of them less important, but it fills in the story of the world in which you're inhabiting. Uh, even the background of those games, the environments, the propaganda that is a hallmark of the way that the Bioshock games play out, all of those things to me are the same as if I were reading a novel and I were, say, a dystopian novel, because Bioshock is dystopian, and I were given background into the history of a dystopian world, I would consider that a catalyzer. The same is true there. Nothing, nothing is limited in that regard just because it is in one form or another. So that, again, is the place where I think we really need to start to consider the discussion that we're having about video games. And we could argue that a film is limited because it's in two hours and it's shot on film, but we don't do that. We have entire degrees that are based on the study and the analytical study of film. And nobody says, well, a film is okay, but it's limited by its form. If video games are becoming increasingly immersive and cinematic, again, I think we need to perhaps change the conversation and the dialogue about how we're talking about this. The other narratological component that is, is unique to video games in many ways, but I think fascinating, kind of calls back to mind if you remember the choose your own adventure games from uh, where you could go through and you could sort of pick A, B, or C as you were reading the book. Uh, many of the video games, especially the ones that are immersive and have a long playtime, follow what's called an open world environment. Okay, so this means that if you were playing the game, you have a main storyline that you would need to complete to finish to finish the game. And you would have any number of side quests or other objectives that you could meet that are not critical to the main storyline, but again add the depth of, of immersion and the depth of purpose to the overall story and add more resonance to that world. And as catalyzers, I think these are really important. The one example that comes to mind is from Infamous Second Son, which I really enjoyed just as a, as a game, but one of the things that the player can choose to do as one of these side quests in the open world is to destroy surveillance cameras that the government has been using. The plot's a little complicated, so just trust me, to, to surreptitiously spy on citizens in public places throughout Seattle. So destroying these cameras is not a requirement. You could play the entire game without doing any of that. But the more that the player does that, it provides a catalyzer in the form of a less oppressed city. Uh, less oppressed city. Your main character, depending on some of the other choices you make, can also become, instead of someone who's feared, someone who is respected. And as that happens, uh, the game sort of transforms. You would see citizens talking more freely, being out in the open more freely, and it transforms the gaming world into a place that the, that the player chooses to inhabit. So unlike the narratological limits of a novel, which is what you get, and the limits of something like a film, which is what you get, there are many games that allow you to transform the world based on the story that you want to be immersed in. And I think, again, that that's a terribly important uh, 
aspect that we really need to begin to consider uh, with video games. The other major issue that has come up, and I think I think it's very problematical, is that a lot of the, the talk that I've seen with regards to this issue of immersion and the issue of this depth of storytelling is that there are a lot of researchers out there who are exploring this very large question, very large question of whether or not video games can teach empathy or morality, can teach it. That's a strange question for me because as a whole I would say probably not. Uh, while the question is intriguing, I think it might be the wrong one to explore. And the question itself I think is inherently unfair because it's not one that we ask of other forms of narrative. Not in that way and not with that kind of overly broad sense of being able to come up with an umbrella answer that would somehow meet um, this, this ver the very broad nature of the question. For example, I've never asked my students if literature, I've never considered, let me put it that way, that the literature that I teach, that I teach to my students is teaching them empathy or morality. I think it can show them different modes of morality and empathy, both on the sliding scale of very, the very good to the very evil, but I don't think that it is teaching that to them. I think that the construction of morality and how we construct morality is so much more complicated than just saying, well, I learned it from a video. Everything I needed to know about morality I learned because I played three video games. Uh, <laughs> most of the time our morality and our sense of ethics is set from the time that we're young based on how we grow up, the culture that we're living in, the geographical area, and so forth. And so I think that we're starting to get to the point where the narratological aspects are starting to get more attention, but it's almost like we're slightly sidestepping what are the actual important questions and instead looking at video games saying, well, can they teach morality? Okay, well, no. And if they can't, but what does that mean if they can't? Does that mean that we discount them as stories with symbols and themes because they can't teach people how to be moral? And if we're looking for video games to teach morality, I don't even know how that works as a question because that opens up so many problems uh, in terms of people learning morality from playing a fictional work. So for me, there are problems then with the questions. Because I think scholars around the globe study literature in large part about what it has to say about our common humanity. Um, a reader might not learn to be like a character in the same way that I might not learn or want to emulate a character I play or see in a video game. But that doesn't mean that there are not things to learn from seeing how life is lived through the eyes and the experiences of a fictional character. So whether that is on screen or in a video game or in a novel or in a short story, that to me is where we get that to me is where we get I think a better question and a more intriguing means of exploration rather than saying well do video games teach morality probably not really so much and I don't think that they should reasonably be expected to do so the so one thing along that line that is becoming interesting is and it's opening up I think a whole new avenue of the, the idea of studying video games and the stories that they tell and how they pull in a gamer and what that means is a recent there's a recent genre that is growing and they've they're being labeled empathy games I don't like that too much because I think that there are games that I've played where I have felt tremendous emotion and even powerful empathy towards what I've seen um, for those of you that game, I don't know if you've heard of any of these, but these are what have been described as uh, games to convey personal stories. And these are tackling heavy issues like depression, alcoholism, and cancer, just, just to name a few. And I think it's a fascinating area of study that's opening up. So instead of these broad, sprawling worlds that maybe take you 40 hours to get through, you end up with a much more personal story, as if perhaps you were reading the autobiography uh, or the biographical experiences of a person who's gone through something. I could give you an example of a game that is, as of this, this talk, a still in development called That Dragon Cancer. It's a small independent title and it was made and well what it does is it chronicles uh, Ryan and Amy Green's son Joel and his battle with an aggressive cancer. And unfortunately Joel succumbed to his cancer earlier this year. He was four years old. And his father had already been a game developer, and his mother, I think, is an art, works as an artist. And what they decided to do was to connect 
who, whichever gamers they can find to be interested in this experience, to understand what they went through as their son underwent his treatment and then ultimately succumbed. So again, very personal story and a personal narrative. So the game doesn't really have much in terms of action from the demos that I've seen. A common thing that you might do in the game is hold Joel while he is undergoing a chemotherapy treatment. Things I think that are uncomfortable in our society and we don't necessarily like to think about. We hear about sick children and we empathize, but what would it mean as an outsider to be allowed into that private world and to be in the role of the caregiver trying to comfort a sick child? I think that's a powerful form of story. And quite frankly, it's the kind of powerful form of story that isn't going to have a form somewhere else. This is its form, where we can immerse ourselves as players and be forced to interact with and to move through the environment. Um, a second title called This War of Mine is actually also going to be coming out, I think, next year. And it will place, instead of a lot of the war titles that you see where you play as a super soldier, where basically you, you get to the point where you can kind of plow through any enemies that come your way. This is going to ask you to be a survivor, a civilian, someone who didn't ask for war, who is trapped in a burned out city with other survivors. And the way that the game is looking like it's set up is that it's going to be based on a lot of really uncomfortable moral, moral choices. So in one of the, the things that I saw uh, advertising the game in its promo was, what would you do if you had a little survival camp, let's say three or four people, and you happen to encounter another survivor? And you know that that could be good because it might be an extra set of hands that could help with the camp. Or it could be another person who needs more resources and that's more food and more medical supplies that you might not have. So what do you do? Do you take the risk and take them into the community? Or do you, um, do you leave them or, tell the, or basically chase them off? In another part, you have options where you can steal supplies from somebody else, which might mean their death. Uh, you can try to barter for supplies, which might or might not work out, or you could choose to go where there's resources that are not claimed by another person. And the game is setting these up so that your choices are permanent. So it's not like you can back out of a choice or everything is miraculously okay. The, the ramifications of your choice are permanent. So again, we read novels that can sometimes show us these terrible moral situations, and we, we live with whatever the author has decided. But a lot of these games that are coming out now are asking us as the player to consider what it is that we want to decide. And again, for better or worse, we're going to have to decide what world we're going to inhabit and what we're going to do when we get when we get stuck with it because it's what we have to live with. So I find those stories, I think, to really be on the forefront of a continuing discussion of narratology. Now before I turn to the issue of gaming culture, the one last thing that I want to say kind of as a whole about video game study, narratological or not, is that I really hope and I hope that that's something that you will all take away from you today, is that there really needs to be a lot more of a sense of integrity in the work that's being done about video games. There is some work that you will start to see out there in some of the academic journals. There's a few books. There's, there's I shouldn't say a few. There's a fair number that are more ludological, but there are some that are, that are narratological in their view. But one of the problems is that there are a lot of places where the research, for lack of a better phrase, just is not very good. Uh, it would not be the kind of research that we would consider that we would consider appropriate for literary study or film study or any other major area of study where somebody would get published for their work. Um, some of the things that I've seen, one of the things that I saw, for example, is an argument that was made about the fact that video games, unfortunately, the author concluded in a very lengthy book. Um, ultimately really couldn't do anything. It was kind of the gist of it. They, they couldn't teach anything. They couldn't really do anything from a story perspective. They weren't doing anything from a story perspective. And I thought, wow, did I get a book from 1990? And I look in the back cover, and it's just from the last couple of years. So, okay, something's not right here. So I go to the back. I'm, I'm reading the chapters, and I'm going to the index at the back, and I'm thinking there's something wrong with the examples that are being used. Uh, the author essentially, at a time when there were so many other titles available, made this argument based on games, few of the games like Grand Theft Auto, and I think that there were a few purely ludological games in there, like maybe a Mario game or Donkey Kong, something of that nature. And I thought, wow, you're building an entire premise that discounts any storytelling in video games by using two examples not only that don't go together, right, because those are not the same thing, but then there are no mo mo recent examples, there's no sense of coherence, and yet that was a published book by an academic press, and that worries me. 
another thing that I saw as a final example was a it was a review slash analysis of Bioshock Infinite uh, that was published almost basically right after it came out as an as an as an initial review of the game. And I've been doing some recent work on Bioshock Infinite for a book chapter uh, I've been in, invited to write, and. Something about the article just struck me as being very odd. It was in an on, it was on in a newspaper, uh, an online magazine, but a very credible one. This is one where they have they're well known for their arts, especially their talk about the arts, the arts world. And this was published as part of their review series. And the author, not to, I, I should, I'm not going to reveal him. The author basically critiqued the game and said, quote, you do not engage with this kind of material if you want to make something disposable. So he basically says that the game raises a number of interesting issues and doesn't do anything with them. I thought, something's not right here. And as I read through the context of the article, first of all, nothing is defined. So what disposable means was never defined in the context of the article the way we would, we would expect it to be. And it came to me as I read through what he had done that he had not played Bioshock Infinite, and I'm sure those of you who game probably have played it or have come across it. Uh, there's a there's a sequence in the game that was released as promotional footage when they were advertising the game. That's what he based his review on. He watched a, uh, without context he, for the well, I see for those of you who played, it's the sequence in the Hall of Heroes, which we know is this propaganda laden area that's supposed to completely well, it, it rewrites a lot of American history. And he looked at one brief section and wrote an entire piece as if he had played the game. So he didn't understand what that section of the game had to do in the larger context, and he didn't even understand it was supposed to be propaganda. So again, the, the, the video games are terribly important from a narratological perspective. They really are. But I think that not only do we need to stop pretending that there's a battle between the ludologists and the narratologists, because there's plenty of place in the middle to have a discussion about both, but I think that we really need to make sure that the academy and those that write about video games and get published hold themselves to the same high standard that we would expect about a discussion of any other element of the arts, literature, fiction, theater, film, etc. So... That being the case, what I'm interested in doing now for the last little part before we go to any questions that you guys have is to talk about gaming culture. The infamous, the infamous gaming culture and the media attention that the media attention that has surrounded and I think overtakes any realistic conversation we might have in the mainstream media uh, about video games, which is unfortunate, but again, kind of the, the reality of that case. So I'd be interested, if for those of you that said that you were gamers, if you want to contribute anything here at, during this part. I know for me, I'm, I'm a gamer. I've been playing since I was very young. Uh, I can remember the ColecoVision and the Atari <laughs> and these heavily pixelated games uh, back in the day, and I've played ever since. So unfortunately now that means I've probably played, oh, I've played in excess of 20 years, probably, well, probably more than 25 years I've, pl I've played video games now. Uh, and certainly, I've seen them evolve from their more their cruder forms into what they've what they're able to become now with technology. And what I find is that even though I'm a professional, obviously I'm a professional woman, I have a career. That gaming can be the one place where things can get a little bit odd and a little bit awkward in ways that I wouldn't expect them to in any other format. And I want to start with my own example and then see if um, any of you guys have comment or any examples you would share. So one of the things that usually happens, and it still happens, is anytime I go to my local GameStop to pick up a video game, uh, a couple of things have happened, and they tend to happen with enough frequency that I can't think it's an accident anymore. Uh, one of the things that usually happens is that when my husband goes with me, I will be ignored completely. My husband doesn't game. So he, he deliberately will go in and like go look somewhere else or go to a shelf so that he's not looking like he wants to interact with the salesperson. So I'm standing there. And the salesperson, nine times out of ten, will completely ignore me looking at them and will go to my husband who's trying to stand in the corner so he's left alone, right? Uh, the other thing that happens is that I'm asked whether or not surely that these are games for my son. Now notice, number one, not for me, and number two, not for my daughter, but for my son. And that's happened enough that I'm it's starting to starting to chip away my self-esteem a little bit. But but no, in, in all seriousness, these are things that consistently happen. I will tell you that I don't game online competitively or co-op 
because I really don't want I see the, the I see the, the you in the back I don't want to deal with what I would most likely deal with um, were I to do that it's just not worth it to me um, I have had I had one time where an older male gamer an adult not not a 16 15 year old kid in one of the gaming stores kind of made a really weird and inappropriate comment to me when I went in there that made me uncomfortable but for the most part it's been oh this surely can't be the gamer so I will just ignore that person and look over here because I will find the, the, the male and I think that's so weird because the the Entertainment Software Association's own publication that tracks sales and numbers and percentages who's buying what very very detailed is that the average age of a gamer is 31 39 percent of gamers are over the age of 36 so that's much closer to me than it is say a, a 14 year old a 14 year old young man and that 48 percent of players are women and I think okay that demographic couched against what I've seen strikes me as very interesting and the media picks up a lot on gender conflict probably too much but I don't want to discount the fact that that's an important conversation so before I talk a little bit more about that the three of you I think that were gamers if I could pick on you have you guys had any experiences positive or negative do you think that a lot of the tension that's being talked about with you know media in the media about gender and gaming do you think that that's a real problem or is it a smaller aspect of gaming that is given much more of a larger stage than it should I don't know if any of you are willing to to share with me. <laughs> I can say from a non-gamer's point yeah. of view, that I, when, when I think of who plays the games and who they're written for without having any knowledge of individual games, I do think of men first for some reason. Um, because I think in my years teaching in high school, I've heard more from the boys um, about games and what did you play last night and what level yeah. are you on then I've heard the girls have conversations about that. So it's just kind of stuck in maybe um, maybe I wasn't hearing all the conversations or maybe the girls don't uh, feel comfortable talking about it in the same way the boys did. But that is the, that is the vision as a non-gamer that I have in my mind. That, oh, that's the boys thing. That's so interesting that you say that. And when I look at the, again, when I look at the, the industry's own statistics, I have to imagine that there are a lot of young women and then, of course, women like myself who are professional who tend not to talk about it, who are just not participating in that conversation. And so, again, like you say, it sounds like it's mostly just just a young male hobby or a young male interest, and not um, and not broader than that. Any of you guys have any experiences that you would be willing to share, or that would be relevant? I guess in terms of the whole uh, uh, male versus female interaction, yeah. uh, who plays video games? A lot mm -hmm. of females will say that they play video games or that they're a gamer or someone, something like that, they get a lot of bad stigmas basically just saying, oh, you're only saying that because you want more attention or whatever else, but you're not really a gamer, which isn't right. really true um, and it's not fair. But, uh, I actually, I think that that's a great point. And it does kind of, and then if you're called on it, it leads to a situation where you look disingenuous because you've, you've made this big pronouncement, oh, I'm part of this group, and then you really haven't played anything, or you do it so casually that trying to identify yourself with a group is, um, again, it, it just doesn't work and it rings false. Um, I'm wondering, kind of as a part of this, if did any of you guys hear about the recent media attention about the female blogger who talks a lot about video games? I see one of you nodding. I don't want to get into this too much because it's very tangled. Her name is Sarkeesian. And she basically, so you're going to see I'm not completely in her camp. Um, I'm very leery of a lot of the more public figures on both sides of the debate about gender and gaming because I think a lot of them are looking for publicity for their YouTube channels and their blogs. So, so that's my bias coming out. Um, that being said, she's done a lot of what she says, um, females versus tropes, where she basically goes through video games kind of cherry picking which is one of my criticisms of her and she says look at all these terrible things and look at all these terrible depictions she never once has really used any of the good examples that I could counter argue are out there and she kinda got into it for lack of a better phrase in the last couple of weeks with some of the the what I think are the younger male gamers and she claimed 
very publicly that she had been threatened, her family had been threatened, they had to move out of their home. There were people who counteracted that saying that she had basically fabricated the tweets that supposedly had come from one gamer that had, that, and it was ugly, trust me, I don't even want to repeat the tweet that she had supposedly received. Um, but there was, some de there was some degree of evidence that showed that she may have fabricated this threat. I'm not saying that she didn't get nasty comments, but she went so far as to say, hey everybody, help me, I've had to have the police come and they've had to take us out of our home because I've received threats of death and terrible sexual violence. And again, the media picked up on it. That was the media's conversation. And the media, and kind of along with that, I think you also see this bleed into some of the fantasy conventions. Things like Comic-Con tend to also get a lot of the negative, and I think it, it collates, a lot of the negative um, attention. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if this is really, as an open question, a problem with gaming and a problem with gamers you and me, those of you sitting out there, or if this is really an issue with what is in reality a very small subset of gamers. I'm not going to say that there aren't some 14, 15, 13 year old boys who aren't going to talk and say really inappropriate things in the anonymity of the internet. I, and I'm not even saying that grown men aren't going to do that. Um, but why would I necessarily think, given the anonymity of the internet, that some of those who claim to be males could be women? Some of those who claim to be women can also be men. So, I mean, we only have the persons, unless we see them in person, we don't really know who these people are that take on these identities and sort of in insert themselves into the, this fracas, if you will. But I also wonder, both on what has been this more militant side like Sarkeesian, and then also some of the gamers who have been reacting with just terrible vitriol, I'm not sure that it's fair that the media presents this as being the face of the American gamer. I really am wondering if this is such a small subset that it's really unfortunate that this is the media. This is where the media would choose to um, to place its attention. But I don't know. Do you guys have any initial comments or thoughts about that? I think for me, um, it, it is really such a small thing, like the gender issue, like who's who and who plays what, and how many or so many people do it. But because it's such a big issue of other things, it gets blown up. So people pay more attention to it. Because otherwise they wouldn't pay any attention to this whole subgenre of stuff going on. That they have to throw in gender issues to get public interest. You know, I think that's a fantastic point. I really do. Um, it's interesting because obviously, yes, there are still some major problems in our culture. We could say that with issues of gender, issues of race. We, we, we've come a long way, but there's a long way we could go, as you say, across a number of media forms. Mm -hmm. But then when I consider global issues, so for example, I could think about the abduction of the girls by Boko Haram, right? I can think about um, mm -hmm. what a group like ISIS has been doing to women. We, don't, we haven't heard that. We've heard a lot about what they've been doing militarily. Um, for me, when I think about that, that to me is so much more of an issue that deserves public debate and action than whether or not a, a video game has a female protagonist. So I think that you're right that this is the it, this is what people are using to try to somehow spark a larger discussion. But I'm almost wondering if it's becoming so one noted that it's beginning to backfire. And I think maybe Sarke the backfire against Sarkeesian, who I think thought that she was going to have more universal um, support, and I don't think that that's what happened. Um, I wonder if maybe that's starting to backfire as a means to talk about very serious issues, is to sort of use gaming as the, I hate to say the, as the whipping boy, but kind of in a lot of ways I think that it, that's what it's come down to. The other thing that I wanted to kind of touch on just very briefly in gamer culture is the issue of the lack of diversity articles that you find everywhere. You, you really do. So you get the issues about gender and gaming, and then you get issues of uh, a lack of diversity in gaming. And I've seen a lot more pop up since Assassin's Creed Unity was announced, because that features a male protagonist, although there is a female character who is a major component of the story. And now you get this idea of, okay, well, we need to have more diversity in games. There are not a lot of gay characters in games. That, that's also very true. And again, I'm wondering, are we putting our attention and our criticism in the wrong place? And I can give you my personal example there. Uh, when I play a video game and it's a good game, so I like Assassin's Creed, Bioshock, all of these games that I've played that I've loved. Uh, I don't play those games thinking 
I'm a woman playing a man. I'm a woman playing a man. That's not that's not the dialogue that is going through my head as I'm playing the game. I'm immersed in what I'm doing, and I'm either engaged or not in the story that I'm playing. And my judgment would be, if I'm supposed to be playing a male character, is that male character written in a way that is believable as a person, as a human being, and not falling into stereotype or other things where I would say, okay, this isn't believable anymore. I do think that there should be more diversity. That is always good for obvious reasons. But again, I'm wondering if it, it becomes a little bit of a red herring where we divert talking about other things that are important in favor of focusing myopically on this one this one aspect of places that can still uh, that can still do some work. So I don't know if any of you guys have any comments on that. You see some of it also in, in another um, medium, um, comic books. That's um, a good point. Get a lot of flack for not featuring uh, a diverse main character group um, and with, with superheroes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's a fair place to put cri criticism, or is it kind of this idea that we're looking very myopically in one place where we should be having maybe a more difficult discussion about culture or culture and society. Well, again, I'm only answering as a non-gamer, but I, I think it, because I'm from the education department, and that's, my okay. interest, that's my interest in here today because we're getting so much literature about positive um, areas yeah. of community and education. So I'm thinking as an adult, when you say that you don't really think of yourself as a woman playing a male role, I can see where you have the maturity to do that, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that a sixth grader or a seventh grader who's playing video games would say, well, it doesn't matter if this is a Hispanic character or a black character or a female or a gay or whatever. I don't know if they have the maturity to say, I'm just putting myself in this mm -hmm. role, not necessarily this character's background for this role. You know what I'm saying? I do, and I actually think that I actually think that's another great point when we speak about young gamers. And obviously, the titles that I've been talking about today are intended for adults. They, these these would be completely inappropriate to sit a little kid uh, to sit a younger child in front of. But I think you're right because gaming is increasingly becoming a tool for learning uh, in in a number of ways in the young in the younger classroom and in the lives of younger kids. And I'm very interested in your perspective as an educator and focusing on those younger students. Would it be better for them to have, would, would they be better having a diversity of characters or is that more problematical because they can't filter or understand it and it would be better for them to essentially play as themselves? I'm interested in what you think about what might work best in that regard for them as, and their identity within a game. I don't know that I really have an answer for that. Oh, I, I, sorry. Not about, um, I don't know enough about how kids immerse themselves in a game because my own kids didn't really play games a lot and I don't play games. But what I mean, the, the reason I'm here and one of the reasons that really interests me in what I'm reading is games have had so much bad publicity or bad, but research is now showing that. Um, students learn resilience from playing games and that students learn problem solving and critical thinking and and that's very interesting to me enough that I want to um, learn more about it in terms of if if it's if you use the term engagement before yeah. uh, if it's going to engage students in a way that classrooms cannot or are not doing it then I I want to know more about it and how it works but um, as far as if a child would, I, I don't know the answer to your question on that one because I just don't have enough background on it. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I think it's I think it's fascinating your perspective and your your background from education looking looking at gaming, and I do think that the good research well I shouldn't say good the the more credible research that we're seeing is exactly what you say the video games teach resilience problem solving things that we say are important for them to be able to adapt and then to begin to grow and and move through. Um, into adulthood. And this again kind of counters the idea that video games teach violence or make people inherently violent. The, the good research out there actually shows that that isn't, that isn't actually true at all. Uh, the only thing, 
The only correlation that they can make is that it's actually the element of competitive gaming that can increase aggression levels. But in the studies that you see that talk about that, they also talk about competitive sports and other things that we say are good for kids and good for society, all trigger in their competitive forms that same level of um, potential for aggression. And, but the counter to that is that games can, in, maybe in that non-competitive form, teach a lot of really good skills that can be hard to quantify and even hard to teach, I think. Uh, in some respects. So, and, and the, the point you make about competitiveness, some of the research is showing that um, gaming is more for intrinsic rewards than extri extrinsic rewards, and that students, or at least some of the things that I've seen, students are able in a game to do what they're not able to do in the classroom. For example, they can go back and keep going over a level until they get it right, or until they feel successful with it, or until they get the badge, or whatever it is they get in a game. Sure. Um, where in the classroom, I'm sorry if you miss it, you're gone, you're lost. You know, you don't have a chance to go back and fix it. We're just moving on, mm -hmm. and that really intrigues me about how we might use uh, video games in classrooms to give students an opportunity to have do-overs and to learn something from talking with others and to feel good about themselves because they went back and fixed the error rather than oh, I'm just a screw up, I can't do it. Right. Um, so there are all those components that I find we could really help our teachers understand education from seeing how kids play video games, at least from what I'm reading. Oh, I think you're absolutely right, and I think what you're saying, actually, I had a conversation with one of my classes the other night about uh, a lot of students not being allowed to fail not being able to, to feel failure and then to work through failure. And I think what you're saying is something that video games, the right games could potentially do even for, for younger gamers, obviously the story and the gameplay scale to their level, because yes, sometimes you have to fail, but failure does not have to be the end of the story. You can persevere, you can go back, you can learn what you did wrong, you can have an opportunity to fix it. And those to me are terribly important lessons that some students, in the discussion I had with my students the other night, they felt like a lot of times they were protected in, in the classroom from failure. You know, the everybody gets a gold star sort of mode. And then when you really hit failure, when you really hit it when you're an adult, it's much harder because, oh, I've, nobody's ever let me fail before. And I think you're right, the games can be maybe be a safe place, where failure can happen, but it, with perseverance you can come through failure. So that was actually kind of and the end of the, the talk that I had, and we have about a few minutes left. I thought I would turn it over now to see if you guys had any general questions or comments that you would like to share. Um, I think talking about what she was saying was like how younger children and diversity and mm -hmm. failure, I think that goes back to the dissonance you were talking about. Yep. Um, whether the gameplay emphasizes who your character is supposed to be mm -hmm. and the role in like the story or whatever actions you're supposed to be doing. If I, I think for as someone who comes from a gaming family, we all came. Okay. My mom's a teacher. I've I've done a lot with education stuff in video games. Uh, I think it kind of depends on if they put them at the focus on the character or on what they're doing and what they're playing, on whether or not it affects their diversity or the communication form. Mm -hmm. I think it really depends on the focus of the game, mm -hmm. like how it use the character rather as a tool or the main focus. That's actually a really interesting way to look at it. Are there any titles that came to your mind when you said that that you thought either did that well or did it poorly? Um, well, I was thinking my mom is a Head Start teacher and I volunteer quite often and they play a lot of video games. Mm -hmm. uh, in their classroom. They actually have a tablet, an iPad, and a touchscreen computer for their kids to use. Mm -hmm. And um, they really like playing games where it's actually not a human that's the main character. I've noticed when I'm volunteering, they like to play like the Sesame Street ones, but they almost always choose the non-humanoid creatures from it, or like a cat or a dog, even rather than a person. So I thought that was kind of an interesting. I think that's fascinating, the idea that when given a choice, a young player says, you know what, I don't want to be the white guy, the Hispanic woman, whatever the choices might be, I want to be the super cat, or I want to be the, I want to be the mythological creature. And, and that, again, per, maybe provides that sense of safety for, that would provide the student to feel comfortable playing the game and learning uh, whatever the, the lesson is that, that's being played in the game, rather than focusing on the identity of the character. That's, that's interesting. 
I think also when they're talking about them being able to fail, if they pick a character that's not necessarily like them, and mm -hmm. they're not stuck on them personally if they fail in the game, oh. I mean, they're working. Because it's so unlike them that they can say, that's not me, that's the character I was playing, so it's it's okay. It's, okay. it's, it's not going to hurt me. Oh wow, that's that's a fascinating. That would be a fascinating line of study. That idea of the psychology of the youngest gamers who are playing the learning-based games, where again they might choose consistently to play a non-human character when given the choice of doing either. Very interesting. I was going to say you can even look at that with adult gamers, like with Skyrim and things like yeah. that. You can pick non-human characters. I know, yeah. like my group of friends, almost always it's non-human characters that are picked and available, or a character as unlike you as possible. Yeah, you know when I played Sky, uh, when I played Oblivion, I played as a non-human character. When I played Skyrim, I played as um, I also what, what did I do? Is why am I not remembering that? I think when I did Skyrim, I did an elf, so that's human-ish. But again, somebody if you looked at the character I created, she looked absolutely nothing like me. Um, so it's not like I was trying to recreate myself as the character in this world. I kind of went for something that was never going to be so, so, something I was someone I was never going to be able to emulate in real life. Uh, but again, the identities we choose is also something that's been um, examined a lot in gaming, especially with Second Life. That's where a lot of those studies have really focused um, more so than console titles. But Interesting stuff. Why, why we play, who we play as when we're given the choice. So do you teach literature courses? I do. Um, I teach... Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. No, yeah, I, was, I didn't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I teach uh, literature right now. Usually I teach the second year seminar that we have at UNLV, which is a world lit course that's designed thematically by, by the instructor. And then I'm also teaching, I tend to teach an early American seminar. Uh, so yeah, I teach, um, and, and it kind of depends semester to semester what, what is needed. But what I try to do is pull in other elements of media into my courses. Uh, and this is kind of where the video game issue really started to come forward in my research. Because uh, what I found is that students can be so disconnected from reading, so disconnected from what it means to be a reader, that if you can show them that reading has other forms and you can show that ideas that they might have thought were cool in a video game actually originated in some obscure text that they thought they didn't want to read. You pull them in and you can draw them into places that they may not have been willing to go or they would have gone kicking and screaming and really resistant, uh, really resistant before. So while you might not have students that know, I don't know if you're using the right term, to code for example, is that what it's called? I don't even know what it's called when you put it into a video game. But you might not have students that have those skills. Have you ever had um, students with gaming background that basically analyze the text through the eyes of a, a gamer and with different paths to go or with different decisions to make or have your kids, your students ever done something like that? You know, I have. Not in their essay writing for me because I tried, to, when, when we do essay writing, I try to get them to stay with the text because they need, that's something that most of them can't do. But I have a digital media project that's a component of my class. And I can give you this example. There were a group of students in uh, my American seminar that were interested in the Native American myths and folklore that we talked about. They took a Harry Potter Lego video game that had a sequence that looked, if you looked at it, had some structural similarity to a couple of the stories. And they they narrated over the top of the game to make it look as if you were watching the myth play out. So it was this really imaginative understanding of, of the two things as two texts. And then seeing how they could be bridged in a way that I thought was absolutely fascinating. It was it was one of the more unique things that I've seen from them. And they, they probably loved doing it. There, and there's the catch, you know, finding opportunities for kids to find a reason for the assignment and, and in, enjoy it while they're learning something. I think so, and I think also in terms of just a general sense of inclusion. Um, obviously, I'm a gamer, so that I don't want to say it's a bias, but that comes out in the course of when I talk about myself to my to my students. And I think that some of the ones who are gamers, I've gotten the impression, have been maybe used to ridicule um, for having that interest before. And so when I when it kind of allows them to share those ideas, and again to reconsider those ideas in in larger context of the course. Uh, in ways that they might not have that they may not have done before, and also for non-gamers, I think it kind of shows them that video games aren't just a colossal waste of time. That there's they can be a time sink, but not a waste of time, and that there's a lot of things that are going on that perhaps deserve kind of a second look or um, a little bit of interest on on the other side of it. 
Do you have a favorite video game? You know, honestly, I'm I'm going to go the route of saying that right now, um, the Bioshock series, I think, has been um, one. It, it's really stood out as one of my favorites for for a lot of reasons. Uh, I think from I think that Bioshock, although there are other games, and I know we pro we probably all have our favorites for those of you that play. Uh, it was really a smart. It was a way to show that a video game could be smart, that a video game could understand philosophy and literature and history and issues like American exceptionalism and manifest destiny and religious propaganda and utilize them in this immersive storyline. So for me, I think it was, well, and Ken Levine obviously invested a great deal of time into building those worlds and those stories, but for me that was the first place where I said, wow, this, this reads like an academic text, not just like a video game where I'm shooting things. So that one I think is going to have to stay as, as my as my favorite. <laughs> we have any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you very much, Amy. It was a pleasure getting to meet you and uh, hear about the uh, things you've been studying and researching. Um, well, this will be on YouTube channel. It was successfully uh, broadcasted, so it will be archived there. If anybody wants to go back and watch it at another time, or if anybody wants to link to it, please. Other than that, uh, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you. And if any of you want to continue the conversation about gaming, I'm always happy to do that. You can reach me um, at my email through through the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I always love to have conversations about gaming. So anytime. All right. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate that you came to listen. Thank you.